So uh, each of us is going to say a few things uh, from our personal perspective on uh, 100 years of solitude. And then we might have some questions for each other. And then we'll invite you to join the conversation with your questions and comments. So let's start with uh, Ramon Saldivar at the other end of the table and uh, take it away. Thank you, Stephen. Well, first of all, um, I'm delighted to see you here this evening. Uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. I hope you have lots of questions and comments because Garcia Marquez is the kind of author that really, you know, requires communities to read him together, you know, because no one reader alone can understand it all or can take it in. There's, it's too broad, too, too rich, too many wonderful things happening. Before I get into that, though, I want to say, where, where does Ricardo go? Thank you very much, Ricardo. What a pleasure to finally meet you after many times of, that we've communicated over email over the years, and it's a pleasure to be here and to see the wonderful things that you're doing, and to my fellow panelists, uh, all of whom um, I have admired, and it's a pleasure to meet you in person. Okay, so Garcia Marquez. Um, so, you know, we're, as Ricardo was saying and as Stephen were saying, we each come at Cien Años de Soledad from various different perspectives. And, you know, and, and uh, mine is, you know, the more boring one, I'm sure, of the panelists tonight. I'm, I'm a literature professor. You know, we, we lead, uh, you know, very narrow lives because we live our lives in our books. And, um, uh, uh, and th that's one way to look at it. Another way is that maybe I, rich, I, I live the richest life of anyone in this book, in this room, because I live in those books. But Garcia Marquez has always been that way for me. I remember the very first time that I read him and um, how it captivated me. And it, I read him in a moment in my life where, you know, all of the external difficulties of everyday life were pressing on me. And it was a moment where I was so unsure about what I wanted to do with my, you know, the, the pathways opening up to me. And as I thought about Garcia Marquez and, and enjoyed the pleasure of just hearing his voice in Spanish and in English, um, it convinced me yet again that, you know, as a young man, I had made a decision that was the right one for me, that thinking and talking and and working on literature and the ideas that literature offers us was a good thing. And I've never regretted it. But okay, so now the boring part. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna tell you about my encounters with Garcia Marquez and why things stand out for me and why I think they're important. One of the ways that Garcia Marquez is often talked about, and, and Ricardo very rightly pointed it out in his introductory comments, um, and Stephen too, of course, um, how the, the immense impact that he has had on world literature, on writers following him. One of my very best friends these days, I'm very proud to say, someone who I, 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 I admire and, and I think and work with sometimes is Juno Diaz. And Juno certainly points to Garcia Marquez as one of the major influences in his career. But it's not just Juno, and it's not just the generation that Juno Diaz represents, but really from the time that Garcia Marquez himself first emerged as a, a voice of of major significance in the world in the 1960s and 70s. You know, he has had a profound impact, not just in Latin America, not just in the Americas, but in Europe, in Africa, in Asia as well. And that's, you know, something, that's a kind of impact that few writers can have. So I think our panelists are going to say something of that, uh, about that, I hope they do. But I wanted to turn that around a little bit. I wanna look in a different direction. Not so much the impact undoubtedly true that he has had Garcia Marquez, all of his works, but in particular Cien Años uh, on world literature. But I wanted to, to look at what influenced him. Where did he come from? What led him to that moment when he locked himself in that room and, cl locked, and clicked the key and produced this magnificent, you know, world-changing piece of work? Did it come entirely, you know, from the nether, you know, and Obviously, it didn't. There, there, were, there were influences. And one real clue for, of, of where it came from for me was an essay that I read by Garcia Marquez once, um, translated in English. He says something that I think is very pithy, very clear, and very specific. He says, I know of no good literature that serves to praise established values. You know, and, and in a way, that sort of sums up 
what, what Garcia Marquez is after. Pra no good literature serves to praise established values. I have always found in good literature the tendency to destroy the established, the accepted, and to contribute to the creation of new societies. So it's not that he's a destroyer. That's not what you want to get from that sentence. It's the creation of new societies. But of course, those two things go hand in hand, that there is a relationship between getting rid of something old and building something new. It's almost like you have to clear the ground and furrow it before something else will sprout. And I think Garcia Marquez was very conscious of that. Well, I want to begin, uh, I'm going to continue my, my comments by just sort of playing that out a, out a little bit. So, you know, I, you know as, as I said, I'm a literature professor here, so here comes my literary critic side. Um, so Garcia Marquez, you know, is writing, you know, about creation, about the, the processes of creativity, and in particular about uh, the, the way those ideas about creation emerge within history. Why in certain communities, in certain moments of time, does something dramatic happen that changes the course of history? Because we know that it does. That you know, the, the, the world proceeds by you know, incremental, sometimes imperceptible, small changes, but sometimes it reaches a moment of great explosion where those small changes lead to something that is a dramatic difference from what came before. And I think that's what Garcia Marquez is, is, is writing about. Um, history. Order, the weight of tradition and the past, the way the past repeats itself. It doesn't simply lie there, you know, passively in, you know, in our memories. It's actively working and eating away at us and shaping us into something new. I think that's what, what he's writing about as well. And finally, because remember, as I said, he's concerned with destruction and creation. He's concerned about the way in which we work at our freedom. Freedom is never just given to us. It is something that we have to, to construct, create, and in some ways be worthy of. Um, and so it's about revolution and, and the way in which revolution means the changes that constitute the necessary growth in each of our own individual lives. It doesn't have to mean you know, the great catastrophic and, and um, you know, world historical movements of nations against nations. It certainly can mean that, too. That's how new societies do emerge. But I think for Garcia Marquez, as importantly as that, it's those, those kinds of battles and conflicts that are worked out and resolved within each of our souls that constitutes the, the very basic quality of history itself. And I think that's what his books are about. So I said that I would give you just a, a, a one moment about uh, my encounter with Garcia Marquez and, um, and who and what influenced him. For me, th that, that first reading of that first sentence of the novel did it all, you know? And, and, and it was, you know, at, at that moment that I realized that that's what literature is about. You know, you have to have that moment that grabs you and you're in. And it grabs you in many different ways and for many different reasons. For me, that moment was one of revelation about the way the past works. It's past, but it's not past. It's future-oriented, and it will work into the future in ways that we can't even imagine. And in the future, we'll get there, and we'll, the past will come alive again. And with that moment, for me, it, it reminded me uh, of one other American writer, then this is the influences on Garcia Marquez that I promised that I would say something about, and that was, of course, William Faulkner. You know, Faulkner, who writes and thinks and argues about many similar things, including the, the famous, you know, uh, uh, quote attributed to Faulkner always, where he says, the past is not past, it's not even dead. It's still with us. And I think Garcia Marquez is, especially Cien Años de Soledad, is an extended, careful, inspired meditation on the way in which the past is who we are. But the past is not passively gone. It is what propels us into the future. So as treatment of the past, in all of his novels, I think, is Faulknerian in a very dramatic way. Now, that's not to say that Garcia Marquez 
isn't Garcia Marquez, that he's really just another version of Faulkner. Not at all, because of course those are two writers uh, writing in two very different historical moments. But what links them, I think, is the element that is probably the most obvious and the easiest piece for us to ignore. And that, and that is that Garcia Marquez and William Faulkner, uh, especially in a novel like, say, Absalom, Absalom, or The Sound and the Fury, and especially in a work like Cien Años de Soledad, uh, what we have is the playing out of what it means to be an American. Not a US person, but um, uh, someone of the new world, of the new societies created on this continent. New societies created out of the destruction of olds and the incorporation of the traditions of the past in a way that keeps them alive. Faulkner, in his own way, is thinking through those issues for North, the, 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 for the North American experiences and Garcia Marquez for the experiences of the South. And in that way, I think we have this extraordinary conversation that helps de define who we are in a continental and even hemispheric sense. So when Garcia Marquez represents and thinks about the past, he's not talking only about a local past. He's talking about the elements that unite us from you know, Alaska, through the, the Pacific Northwest, into the Southwest, through Central America, into Peru and Ecuador and Bolivia, and all the way through to Tierra del Fuego. It is that commonality of construction and destruction, of creativity and the keeping alive of history and creating new worlds, new worlds that, that are part of who we are today, even though they may seem to have passed. So that's the, the, the take that I offer you tonight. I there is much, much more that I could say. And including what I wish I could say is how much I miss Barack Obama every day. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, actually a wonderful introduction, I think, to what 100 Years of Solitude um, means and how it sort of came into the world. Um, I first uh, read Garcia Marquez uh, when I was in junior high. And um, the first book I read was um, 100 Years of Solitude. It was a gift to me from my dad. And I still remember um, that it was a South American edition. And it was a, you know, a soft cover. And it was well worn. It was used when when he bought it. Quite clearly, um, who knows where he picked it up? Um, probably Chicago and the South Side, and one of the bookstores in the Mexican neighborhood. Um, what you have to understand is that my dad was a very anti-communist, very exuberantly anti-Castro Cuban refugee. So for him to walk into my room and hand me 100 Years of Solitude was a leap of various uh, you know, miles, really. It was, pretty, it was a pretty big deal. And when he came in, uh, I still remember the words, uh, because he had used almost the exact same phrase about Alejo Carpentier. And uh, he handed me the book, and he said, es un hijo puta. Un comunista hijo de puta, pero esa es la gran novela de Latinoamérica. <laughs> so, uh, as you can imagine, this coming from my dad, I wasn't real enthused about reading this book. I actually kind of put aside, okay, papi, está bien, no te preocupes, you know, slip it under my bed. Um, and didn't really, uh, honestly, I didn't get to it for months because um, it came from my dad, the anti commie, you know? <laughs> And uh, I, I wasn't really sure what kind of propaganda this was that he had just handed me. <laughs> when I finally got around to it, and I don't know what actually provoked me to open it, I do remember that my first reading of it, I stayed up really late, that I just could not put it down. And it was a really um, obsessive kind of reading for several days. 
Um, at that point, I think it's it's important for at this point. I think it's important for me to say a couple of things about my management of Spanish. Um, I came to the United States when I was six and a half years old, and all of my formal education has been in English. I speak really fluent, accentless Spanish because my father was obsessed with the idea that we would one day go back to Cuba. And because we would one day go back to Cuba, we would have to learn to read and write and function in Spanish to be able to take on the tasks of citizenship in some new utopian democracy. Um, I was the oldest, so my brother got spared all of the experiments that he enacted with me. Uh, but one of the experiments, of course, was to keep my uh, literacy in Spanish alive, and that happened through, you know, readings. Rarely did I get a whole book. It would usually be like a story or a series of articles or something like that. But what I often found as a kid without formal education in Spanish who um, functioned in English almost all the time, you know, I mean, I, I came home and, you know, flipped on American TV. I was listening to American rock and roll. I was in school entirely with, uh, you know, American English speaking, English monolingual uh, classmates, um, was that a lot of the Spanish seemed very florid and very impenetrable to me. Um, I've, I was not put off so much by the, the language itself, but by the style. One thing that happened when I began to read 100 Years of Solitude is that I immediately noticed the difference in the language. If you actually look at the text, the sentences are so short by Latin American standards. <laughs> I mean, they are really remarkably economical. You know, paragraphs actually end before the page. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> um, you know, years later, I would uh, you know hear or read Garcia Marquez say that uh, he'd read the English translation by Gregory Rabassa and that he thought it was better in English than it was in Spanish. And I, and you know, as a as somebody who has become a translator, I think one of the reasons why that may be so is because, in a weird way, the language uh, follows a a, a construction that more closely, I think, uh, appeals to the English ear, you know, the English hearing ear than the normal Spanish or the typical, not normal, but typical Spanish language uh, kind of, uh, you know, stuff that we were used to. To be clear, I've never really read 100 Years of, of Solitude in English. I've only read, we were kind of going back and forth about this. I thought I was going to read it for this panel, but I just couldn't bring myself to it. Um, um, so I, I've only read bits and pieces of it in English, but I treasure it in Spanish because I feel like when I started to read uh, 100 Years of Solitude and I entered into this world, I really entered Latin American literature and my love for Latin American literature really began. I think for me, the, what I take away from the book is that the book was a way to talk about history which is very, very important to me uh, because our history in Latin America is so screwed up. And the way we tell our history is screwed up. And the way that our history is told here in this country tends to be even more screwed up. And one of the ways that Garcia Marquez sort of approaches history in this book is by saying, well, the history, history is actually what happens to us. And history and the things that we are told, the family sagas that we are told are also a part of history. Um, and so it was a way to enter into it um, and learn the history, understanding that some parts of 100 Years of Solitude were actually only like three steps removed metaphorically from real events and really terrible things that happened. Um, but also to read it as a cautionary tale of what would continue to happen if we didn't break certain patterns. Because as Ramon was pointing out, things get repeated a lot in 100 Years of Solitude. Um, and in, in the end, you end up thinking, we have to change this. This has to change for us to be able to uh, 
lay claims in a different way to our countries, our nations in Latin America. Um, these days, when I think of, of Garcia Marquez, as his influence, I think of it more as sort of like the way Cubans uh, in Cuba think about Fidel. You know, you don't actually name him anymore. You know, you just, he's just there. You know how in Cuba nobody actually says Fidel, they just go. <laughs> and everybody knows what you mean. I feel that way about Garcia Marquez. It's like, you know, he's just, he's so, uh, has so permeated the consciousness, I think, of Latin American literature that I think even people who don't realize they're being influenced by Garcia Marquez are actually being influenced by Garcia Marquez. I think, like when you talk about Juno, if I remember correctly, it was pointed out to him that he sounded and had ideas that seemed very Marquesian, and then he went and said, oh yeah, wait a minute. And then he kind of got drenched in it, and then that influence came, became closer and more deliberate and more conscious. Um, I think also this new generation has a tendency to reject a lot of the magical realism, um, but not the issues. Uh, reject the magic, reject a lot of the tone of 100 years of solitude, but not the issues. We're still battling the same issues, which is sort of unfortunate. One thing that I noticed when in sort of rereading it for, um, for this panel, and then I'll pass it on to Scott, um, is that the tone of the book is always surprising to me when I pick it back up. Everything that happens in 100 years of solitude is terrible. I mean, it is just one terrible, horrible thing after another. But the tone is warm, very human, and there's just a dash of awe that sort of permeates everything. I mean, that opening line about the ice really pays off beautifully when they see the ice, when they actually go to discover the ice, so to speak. And uh, when Diaz's response is, this is the greatest invention of the century. <laughs> you know? And of course it was to him. You know, what a, and, and it's so amazing because for us, ice is so quotidian, right? Um, and growing up in the Midwest, for me, ice was not only quotidian, but you know, horrible. Uh, it was really hard to look at it with any wonder when somebody had to go out and dig the car out. Um, but it, that, I think, is really gone now <laughs> from Latin American literature. Our tone is much more ironic and dry and sort of wry. But that is, that is, I think, also one of the miracles of 100 Years of Solitude, that as he's telling these terrible, terrible, terrible things, the voice is always sort of full of wonder. Wow. Well, thank you to uh, Aki and uh, Ramon. Uh, sorry, Achi and Ramon for those remarks. That's hard to follow up with. And thanks to Stephen for the great introduction. And of course, thank you to Ricardo and Litquake for bringing this whole panel together. This is a wonderful book. And it's great to see so many people out to hear about and talk about it and be a part of, you know, keeping it uh, going and alive. So kind of following on uh, what Ramon said, this is a huge book with so much in it. And I couldn't really choose just one way to go here. So instead of just talking about one thing or two things in this book, I decided to put together six short takes on 100 Years of Solitude. And that's what I'm going to give you right now. I wrote this all out, and I'm going to do my best not to read this to you because that would be painful for both of us. But we're going to see how that goes. Uh, so number one. 100 Years of Solitude as the Discovery of History. Uh, so when we first meet Macondo, it's kind of in this state of Edenic purity. Uh, the residents don't die, they don't seem to age. It's very cut off from the rest of the world. As you might recall, uh, Jose Arcadia Buendia discovers that the earth is round, which shocks and scandalizes his wife, Ursula, who does not believe him. Uh, they're, they're rediscovering things that humans have known for centuries, and they're kind of just very cut off, and I kind of picture it way up in the Andes, 
away from civilization as it's known elsewhere in the world and all of that stuff. Um, it's just kind of a state of self-sufficiency. And even the tragedies in, uh, in Macondo in the beginning, like, for instance, the plague of insomnia, uh, they pass through more as these timeless mythical events than catastrophes that really exist in kind of a historical framework. I just kind of picture them as, you know, abiding and weathering all of these events that are happening, but, you know, no one ever dies, nothing ever really changes, just whatever. Um, but then this all changes once the town is discovered and comes to exist within the cultural history of Colombia and the rest of Latin America. And as you go forward in the book, more and more the sense of modernized time begins to creep in. Uh, Macondo ceases to be this little self-sufficient island. It becomes part of the history of Colombia. Uh, Jose Arcadio's son goes off and becomes a revolutionary, and it begins to interact with the rest of the nation, the rest of the continent. And as this happens, it begins to participate in the creation of history, and it becomes part of this narrative, this historical narrative, this kind of global historical story that we're telling that really binds us all. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, the first sentence, which... You guys already talked about the first sentence. I knew you were going to do that. Um, so it's unforgettable, as already been said. In Gregory Robasa's English translation, it is, Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Orleano Bundia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. And I think that the book's peculiar way of moving through its story is right here. Uh, the way that Garcia Marquez is constantly, constantly looking forward and backward in the narration all at once. Uh, how this massive story creates its own endpoints, only to reveal that they're not really endpoints, but points of synthesis. Uh, as, you, as you may recall if you've read the book, Colonel Aureliano doesn't die in the firing squad. Uh, that's mentioned in the opening sentence, even though if you do read that opening sentence, you get the impression he's going to die there. Uh, in fact, that firing squad opens up a whole new era in his life. And the book does this constantly. It's constantly foretelling events. And then once you get there, you realize this isn't the end. It's just a new chapter, which, again, very historical the way that works. Um, and this first sentence also communicates a sentiment that we're gonna see all the time throughout this book, uh, that these personal moments in life can be on the same plane as these historical revelations. And you have a young boy discovering ice put side by side with this revolutionary who becomes the most infamous person in his nation's history, uh, as so far as revolutionaries go, facing a firing squad. And these two things are kind of equated right there in that sentence. And you see that all the time throughout this book, the, the personal and the historical kind of being placed on an equal playing field. So number three, 100 years is family saga. So by the time Gabriel Garcia Marquez came along, the family saga was a pretty antiquated form. Uh, I would say that it belongs to the 19th century, and you get all these gigantic novels like Middlemarch that just go down the line of families. And I would say that it kind of reaches its end with Buddenbrooks, uh, the great novel by Thomas Mann, the book they say that he won the Nobel Prize for, more or less. Uh, that book was published in 1901, and I feel like it's kind of this end point. Like, now we've finished with the family saga, we can start to discover what the modernist novel is going to look like. We can have, like, Joyce and Virginia Woolf and people like that. Um, but then after some 50-some years of modernist experimentation, mid-century writers began to develop, to, to rediscover the family saga in their own form and reinvest it with a postmodern energy. So, for instance, Gunter Grass's The Tin Drum, which tells the story of these generations of people kind of culminating in this very strange narrator. Uh, and I would say 100 Years of Solitude is also a family saga. And, you know... Right here in, in my edition, you have the whole family, which is very helpful because everybody has the same name. And yeah, it's names, people. There's lots of names in the world. Um, 
So anyway, but it, it tells the mythology of four generations of the Buendias, and it blurs the line between the personal, the prophetic, and the historical, while also smashing together different uh, concepts of time. You don't just have the historical time. You have the mythological time. You have the personal time. And they're all kind of blurred in these, uh, this family saga. But I also feel like 100 Years is a bit of a throwback. I think it actually resembles Mons Buddenbrooks quite closely in many ways. Uh, if you've read Buddenbrooks, you know that it tells the story of a de decline of a family. You know fairly early on that this family is going to come to a demise. You're going to reach the end of the line of this family, coterminous with the end of the book. And that family comes to represent the end of a historical order. It's kind of the end of the, uh, the empire and... The, the beginning of new kind of more modern ways of organizing a country as this Buddenbrooks clan is supplanted by other families. And I feel like the same thing is happening in 100 years, where by the end of the book, the Buendias has come to an end, but it's clearly not the end of history. There's this whole historical framework that they become a part of, and you know that that's going to keep going on, even though the, uh, the pigtailed son dies as the last of the clan. Uh, number four characters as commentators. Uh, I, was, I was reading this book again as I was preparing for this panel, and as I was reading it this time, I noticed finally that um, throughout this novel, Garcia Marquez has his characters kind of throw in lines. There will, there will be these long paragraphs of things that are happening, uh, narration, and then there will just be this one little line from somebody that kind of punctuates it. And I thought, hmm, it's almost like they're sports commentators. They're kind of giving you this commentary about what's going on as uh, Garcia Marquez narrates in that third-person omniscient. And I feel like in this way, Garcia Marquez makes them into both um, participants and observers, individuals who are both creating the narrative, kind of living the narrative and seeing what happens, but also standing above it, giving you kind of insight and the global viewpoint into what's going on. Uh, and that kind of adds a certain three-dimensionality to the storytelling for me. Uh, and I also think that it contributes to a strange feeling that I get when I read this book, which is that uh, it's kind of walking the line between myth and history, that these characters are both human individuals, but also something like demigods at once. Number five, 100 years as circle. Um, so 100 Years of Solitude kind of swerves through its plot in what I feel is a hook-shaped movement. Uh, Garcia Marquez, again and again, he'll kind of run out forward, and then he'll kind of hook around and go back to before we started. And then he'll kind of run out backward that way, and he'll hook around, and then we'll be forward again. And we'll be just a little bit further than when we originally began. And as you read this, as I read this book, I felt like it constantly has this figure eight movement where we're going backwards and we're going forwards. And it's a very kind of slow, halting, circular kind of progression, but that's how we're moving forward through this book. Uh, just to return to the first sentence, you can see how, how it exemplifies this. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Oriano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. So we, we run out into the future, to the firing squad, and then we hook back around to his childhood. And I feel like more and more as you read this book, you see that's how it's moving. Um, and that's not even the time of the beginning. That, that is not the time of the beginning. You're absolutely right. Uh, but but though, though this book is circular, it's, it's not perfectly circular. We, we don't go around and come back to where we begin. We're going in more of a spiral. It's, it's very Hegelian like this. Uh, and I feel like things are being repeated. History is repeating itself. But there is, there, this history that repeats is subjected to the historical forces that are always kind of pushing it forward. Uh, and last, number six, 100 Years as Literary Big Bang. Uh, 100 Years was not the first magical realist novel, and nor is it the biggest one, uh, it's, but it is the most widely beloved. It's estimated to have sold some 45 million copies worldwide, 
And who knows how many more readers it's accumulated through borrowing from friends, lending from the library, and of course, outright theft. And, and a, funny, a funny commentary on this, uh, before the panel, Ricardo was talking to us and he said that altogether throughout the San Francisco Public Library branches, there are 70 copies of this book. And he said, if I remember correctly, he said 60 of them are currently circulating, which is amazing, a book that's 50 years old and it's still circulating that many copies. So I'm sure 45 million is a conservative estimate of this book's readers. Um, but it is a book that's big enough to house all of these readers, and it has many, many, many books inside of it. Uh, in just a paragraph, Garcia Marquez can give you everything you need to have a novel of your own. In just two lines of dialogue, he'll give you two lives. This is a book that's really brimming with novels. Uh, it was fe fecund enough to seed a generation of literature from an entire continent, and it was also so brilliant that here we are now, 50 years later, still finding things to say about it. Thank you. So, informal survey. How many of you have read this book in Spanish? And how many have read uh, Gregory Rabassa's translation? Okay, um, because I want to talk about the, the medium through which most of us have received this book, which is uh, Gregory Rabassa's uh, phenomenal rendering of it in English. Um, and to, to place a little bit of emphasis on uh, the translator as the, as the medium uh, who has given us this amazing version of this book. Uh, the book was first published in Spanish in 1967. The English translation came out in uh, a hardback uh, book in 1970. I think I read the paperback probably in 1972, which coincidentally was when I was first uh, beginning uh, to experiment with the possibility of my own uh, work as a translator. The reason for that, or one of the reasons that I started writing translations, I have, I'm not of a Latino background. I'm not a, I, I, did, I wasn't raised uh, speaking two languages. I studied Spanish in high school. It came easily to me while I was getting B's and everything else, I got A's in Spanish. So I, I, I learned the fundamentals uh, pretty well. And when I was reading uh, translations, uh, the few translations that were available of uh, Spanish and Latin American poetry in 1972, I mean, there were basically two poets that you ever heard of who still are the you know sort of overwhelmingly dominant uh, Spanish language poets in translation, and that is uh, Garcia Lorca and uh, Pablo Neruda. Uh, so there were some versions of, of uh, Lorca and Neruda that were circulating, and, and they were not the only books that were available uh, in translation, but they were the ones most readily available. And when I was reading the, the translations of these books, of the of the poetry of these of these poets, and I was looking at the Spanish on the left hand side and looking at the English on the right hand side. I mean, these were famous poets who I considered very. Uh, I, I mean, I gave them great authority over literature because I was just a kid. I mean, I was in my in my early twenties, uh, middle early to middle twenties, and. Um, but I was, I just, they, it didn't sound right to me in English. Uh, and so I started experimenting with my own uh, versions of these poems and trying to render what I heard in the Spanish. So this is the time of my, in my personal life when I'm discovering translation as, a, as an art that is not, uh, in which the translator is not just like a stenographer for what the author said. The translator is actually recreating the new text so it's in this moment of my life that I pick up 
100 Years of Solitude, uh, translated by Gregory Ravasa. And the prose in English, it, it almost made my head explode. It was, it, was so, it was so phenomenally written in English. And I, of course, noticed that it would, I mean, I knew it was a translation. And I'm thinking, this is what translation is. This, this translation is a, is a potentially um, captivating creative art. It's not just a uh, sort of a, a substitute for reading the original or a, or a, uh, a kind of pointing in the direction of the original. It's an, actually a recreation of the book, and of course, as Achi said, uh, Garcia Marquez famously remarked that the 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 Rabasa's, Rabasa's version was more, um, you know, was was a better read uh, than than the Spanish. But for me, it, it, reading Gregory Rabasa's version of this book was probably the most inspiring example. I mean, it was certainly at the time the most ex inspiring example I had ever seen of. Of, of literary translation. And it really, um, the difference between the, the natural fluency and the natural sense of invention that was going on in the, in the English um, just really put to shame the, the translations of all these uh, American poets who were, and English poets who were translating uh, Neruda and Lorca. So I thought, wow, this is really, um, this is translation is much more than what I see going on in the translation of poetry. So that that was a real revelation for me. Now a few years ago, Rabasa uh, published a, a memoir, which some of you may know, called uh, "If This Be Treason: uh, Translation and Its Discontents." And it's not a book of translation theory. It's a it's a it's sort of an anecdotal account of his working with with various uh, different authors and different books that he had translated. Um, and he says, he, he uses as, as an example of the kinds of choices that he had to make, uh, beginning with the, the title, Cien Años de Soledad. Um, Cien Años can be a century, it can be a hundred years, or it can be 100 years. Those are at least three of the possibilities. Uh, and then soledad, you know, can be solitude, it can be loneliness, it can be variations on, on that word. Uh, the translators often use uh, dictionaries of synonyms to find uh, English, uh, just the, the possible equivalents, the possible suggestive resonances of, of different words. So Rabasa talks in, in this memoir about how he decided to, to uh, make 100 Years of Solitude the title of the book, rather than, uh, say, A Century of Loneliness, or A Hundred Years of Loneliness, or A Hundred Years of Solitude. He said he, said he didn't want a hundred years, because that, it's not just any old hundred years. It's like a very specific uh, period of time. And he felt that solitude had a lot more uh, resonance than loneliness. Um, and these are the kinds of choices that, tra I mean, this is just the title. And he also talks about the, uh, his, his choice of the verb in, uh, uh, in the, at the end of the first sentence where, he, where it, the, the phrase is uh, the, conocer el hielo. And uh, as most of you who have studied Spanish know, uh, conocer typically means to be acquainted with or to know a person, um, but, or, or to be introduced to someone. So he went through all these possibilities and then, you know, I, I think it was just like a light bulb went on in, in his head and it occurred to him that discover was the right word. Now, uh, the critic that Rabasa famously calls Professor Horrendo, which is the, the, <laughs> The scholar who reviews your your translation um, in some big publication and points out all the the errors, uh, or you know, he'll he'll fixate on on one word and and as evidence that you don't really understand Spanish, you know, which is a typical error of language experts in understanding what 
translation is because the 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 creativity involved in selecting the word discover which is it works so fabulously well in english uh is something that only uh an artist rather than a uh a language scholar would uh, would come up with so so Rabasa became a hero of mine uh, for this book and then subsequently I mean the first uh, uh, book he translated from of Latin American literature and the thing that launched him on his career as a translator was uh, Julio Cortázar's Hopscotch which he came to translate quite by accident because he like walked out of his house in one direction instead of the other one day and he ran into somebody, I, I, and maybe it was an editor who was looking for a translator for Cortázar's book Hopscotch, uh, which w in some ways is an even more seminal uh, work of uh, Latin American fiction than, than Garcia Marquez. Uh, so uh, his, uh, Rabassa's translation of Hopscotch masterpiece. Rabassa's translation of uh, what I think is one of the greatest uh, Latin American novels, uh, uh, Conversation in the Cathedral by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa. Amazing, amazing English writing in that book. Uh, and uh, th these three books, I think, are just classics of, of literary translation as well as classics uh, of literature. So. I want to acknowledge the fact that most of us have gotten this book by way of Gregory Rabassa, and he totally rose to the occasion and, you know, I think gave it to us in terms as close to the experience of reading the original in Spanish uh, that we could hope for, for those of us who, I mean, I read Spanish, but I'm lazy and, and uh, you know, a lot of times I'll read translations, especially of fiction. Um, okay, so the, that that was one important important personal uh, uh, impact this book has had uh, upon me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the popularity of this book because it is not only a classic work of literary genius, but it's you know monumental international bestseller, which doesn't frequently happen. I mean, this is really unusual for a book of such high literary ambition to, to have so many millions of readers. Uh, and I know uh, my sister-in-law, who was a, a returning, uh, she, went, she went back to, to uh, college uh, later in life, and she was, uh, uh, I think she was, uh, summa cum laude at the college she went to. She was like in her 50s when she got her BA in, in English. And, and she's a big reader and, you know, a reader of not highly literary books, but kind of best-selling type books. Well, she told me uh, sometime in the 70s, she was reading uh, 100 Years of Solitude. She was extremely impatient with, uh, with the author. Like, why couldn't he just like tell a story in a straightforward way why were all these what were the, all these digressions and all these ridiculous things happening and and uh, she struck me as a as a more typical reader you know literate but not highly literary uh so it's all the more astonishing to me that this book has sort of overcome the resistance of readers of conventional fiction you know kind of bestseller type readers and you know become a bestseller itself and uh, i mean it's very inspiring in that respect in the sense that um it shows that you don't have to i mean for novelists uh, of whom uh, achi is the only real novelist on this panel i've published one novel but it, it was only because it was a book i had to write otherwise i'm I like the short forms, um, but but it, it it revealed that you cannot compromise your your intellectual, creative, literary values in order to you know attract a popular audience. You can actually, if you if you if you go far enough with your 
uh, creative imagination, you can reach a lot of people. That that uh, it, you shouldn't be discouraged from from trying to reach a big audience with uh, a book of the highest uh, literary value. So, and the last thing that is of interest to me, since I'm also a journalist, um, is that Garcia Marquez, of course, uh, started out as a newspaper reporter, uh, wrote journalism for most of his life, even after his fame as a, as a fiction writer, uh, published a good deal of reportage and nonfiction. Uh, and in these, uh, some interviews I have read with him, he talks about uh, journalism as kind of anchoring him in reality and giving the, 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 the ima his imagination a kind of grounding that kept it from sort of going out of, out of orbit. So there's this tension in, in his work, in, in this book in particular, but in a lot of his other books too. Uh, history has already been mentioned as an important element. And, um, but there's this interesting tension between fact, between really cold hard facts and the, the wildest flights of imagination. And I think it's the synthesis of those two elements that, that gives his, his, uh, this book and his other books their power because it's not just some sort of airy fantasy. It is, it is imagination wedded to history, to facts. And that can be a very powerful combination and a great model for anyone writing today in English to be able to incorporate the reality of our time uh, without um, merely replicating it or complaining about it, but transforming it through, uh, uh, through the power of the imagination. And, and Garcia Marquez, who was a very political uh, person, uh, and, and Julio Cortazar, who's somebody I know a little bit better because I've translated his poetry, also spoke of this um, as, as kind of public uh, leftists in Latin American literature, they were constantly being, uh, being hounded by political people to be more didactic in their, in their work and to be more polemical in their work. And I've noticed both Garcia Marquez and Julio Cortazar spoke of like the most radical thing you can do as a writer is to, is to write, and write well, and write with, uh, with great imagination. That that just directly addressing the political reality of your time is not enough. Because there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of uh, newspaper columnists who, who can do that. You know. So to 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 invent to reinvent reality, is is one of the highest. Uh, uh, roles of the uh, of the the fiction writer. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, does anyone up here have uh, things you want to add or subtract or, or or ask or should we just? Yeah, let, let's. Uh, we're we're here to hear what you have to say too. So if anyone has any questions, comments, uh, arguments. Uh, we we are here to hear them. Well, I was responding to something that you said, Ashi. Um, I read it twice, the book. The first time I read it, I was pretty young as well. And when I picked it up again as an adult, I had a memory of the book that was so entirely different mm -hmm. than the book I read as maybe a 16-year-old. Yeah. And I think that I responded to the warmth Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the characters were so warm and they had such a, a good attitude towards what was... Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
<laughs> I think we could hear that. Uh, because yeah. they had uh, they had yeah. such a, um, a a good attitude towards what was happening, or not a good attitude that I'm not expressing it well, but there wasn't a lot of moaning and groaning. Mm -hmm. So I didn't notice it. And then when I read it the second time, I thought, is this the same book? Anyway, that's what I had to say. No, I had a very similar reaction when I read it again as an adult. And it was years later when I read it. I rediscovered so many things about it that really just uh, you know, flew right by me. Uh, the first time, even though the first time I also had to contend with having to converse with my dad about it, so I was forced to go back and recognize a lot of these things. But even, even you know, the, every every time I read it, I feel like I get something else from it. I think it's rich that way. I think it's it's one of the the wonderful things about it. You know, I can't remember now who it was, but there was one critic who uh, bitched and moaned about how. There was so much on every page that, you know, it was sort of like your sister-in-law, you know, like just there's too much. There's just too much. It's just overwhelming. Um, and I think that can be true, but I think that's also part of, you know, the, the fabulousness of the book, that there is so much that you can keep, you know, harvesting from it. Yeah, I like very much what you said as well, you know, um, just to add to, to what Achi said, because, um, you know, not only is every reading that you do differently, you know, I, I think, you know, just because you change, uh, and the book oh, hasn't changed, you change, but the other piece is that you have the memory of the first reading, you know, and that's sort of interacting with what's happening to you right now. And so it's, you know, you have this sort of interesting shadow of you, and the book, as well as the real you and the book interacting. And that, and Garcia Marquez, I think, in particular, plays with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I find that I enjoy so much reading him. Uh, I, I find that the horror is almost an entertaining yeah. <laughs> horror. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. the writing is so delicious. <laughs> And uh, there's so much excitement and just pleasure in what I'm reading that um, I sometimes look at myself and I say, what the hell am I enjoying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what you're enjoying, I think, and this happens in, you know, in a lot of literature, and, and I think it's one of the ways in which if we survive the current era, um, it could result in some really amazing literature. Because what I know, I know, I don't think I don't think it's likely to happen immediately. Uh, but I know one of the things that I notice in my own work is like the worst uh, things are going on in my life. The more I have to somehow transform them into something else, and I think that this is a a principle of of uh, of, of artistic invention. You know that you have to turn the difficulties of existence into something more bearable, and one way to do that is through art, and you know specifically in this case, uh, and the way literature. M maybe more directly than certain other arts, um, especially something like music, um, addresses directly the content of, or can address the content of the time. You know, even if you're writing a, a story about people uh, who have no, you know, th it, there's no uh, direct uh, chronicling of the, of, of the historical moment, the history in which they are living affects their individual lives, their private lives, in a way that um, just permeates them. And you know, this is what artists do: they take everything that's floating around in the culture and they turn it into something very specific. Um, so I think that's the reason that we uh, you don't have to feel guilty about enjoying reading. You know, in fact, I I, I think that um, you know that's one of the 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 salubrious uh, aspects of literature is that it can give us unbearable information in a way that is that is bearable and it, and it makes it, uh, it and it turns it into something else and this is the you know I think this is really one of the jobs of the of the artist as I was uh, 
as I was reading it, I I noticed exactly what you're talking about that that almost sense of cruelty that uh, Garcia Marquez is almost taking a malicious pleasure in doing what he does to the characters, and and for me that really kind of created um, the sense of doom that I feel throughout the book that. Every time somebody in the Buendia clan tries to get ahead or is having success in life and things are going well or there's some kind of optimism or aspiration, you know that it's going to come back around and there's going to be something that happens on the other side. And that doesn't happen to all the characters in this book. There's the people from the Colombian government who start to participate in the life of the town and they're fine, or or there there are people from the uh, the banana plantation who come to have business, and their aspirations result in profit for them. But but in the Macondo people, um, there's that kind of sense of doom that it's always going to end up the wrong way for them. And and I feel like that that sense of cruelty is a part of that. That almost you know, Garcia Marquez is this godlike figure, and I'm going to show them. They're they're going to know what the world is really like. And he does show up at the end of the novel, just ever so briefly, as sort of like saying, and I have been a witness to this. It's it's another way in which he plays with reality and yeah. with stuff. But I mean it's I think it's it's also part of like I'm kinda dicking with you. <laughs> well uh, he 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 admits that a lot of the a lot of the, the episodes in the book are uh, are based on stories that were told to him by his mm. grandmother or yeah. his aunt. Um, so it's not as if, I mean, it's the magical realism is he, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't make any distinction between magic, magic and realism. In fact, there's a little passage in this, uh, in this, one of these interviews here. He says, um, I was able to write 100 Years of Solitude simply by looking at reality, our reality, without the limitations which rationalists and Stalinists through the ages have tried to impose on it to make it easier for them to understand. Um, our reality is it in itself out of all proportion. Um, you know, so, so, and I've heard other Latin American writers say this, magical realism is really just realism, you know, in a tropical setting, because things become... You know, look what just happened in Puerto Rico. You know, is that real or what? Um, it, 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 I mean, if you read that in a novel that, you know, a whole nation was flattened, you would think, well, this couldn't possibly happen. But, you know, it does. Um, we had a question over here. Um, first, just thank you for your words and for pulling me back into the world of that book. Hello. <laughs> I was just thanking them for their words. It's been great. Um, I, like many of you, I first read the book when I was, I think, 18 or 19. And besides making my brain do a complete backflip, my brain was still malleable at that point, college age. It sent me on a whole different trajectory. I ended up majoring in Latin American literature and just going in a completely different direction. But what I actually wanted to ask is if any of you know about the book that Garcia Marquez was writing when he died, uh, In Agosto Nos Vemos. I have found bits and pieces of it online in Spanish and I'm kind of working my way through it. But wonder if any of you know what has become of it, if it is translated into English. Nope. Um, and how you would translate the title. Yeah. <laughs> in Agosto Nos Vemos? But I've I've read a little bit about it, and what I understand is I don't think it's even published in Spanish. No, right. No. Yeah, I I don't know if it's considered a complete manuscript or if you know if there are kind of legal ways to publish it at this point. So I, I don't know. May, maybe maybe my esteemed fellow panelists know a little bit more, and I, I would translate it as something like a, "We'll see each other in August." Yeah. See you in August. See you, yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah, either way. I anyway, would, yeah. you can find it online. Some newspapers yeah. uh, published it, but right. I don't know if it's yeah. actually a publication. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't think the estate has given permission no. for that publication. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's what I heard from Wendy Guerra, who's yeah, very close to... probably pirated versions to, that have appeared in press. And right. I, yeah, but um, 
My guess is that it will appear at some point. At some but, point, but, exactly. But it, like all the Hemingway stuff yeah. that came but, out but later, right? Exactly. Who would have thought that we would have a new Hemingway novel, in, you know, in the last in in in, in the twenty first century? Yeah. Uh, so they do appear. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yes, um, I, I appreciated if you could comment on the ending of the book, which mm -hmm. to me is one of the most powerful endings mm -hmm. of any uh, any book I've read, mm -hmm. and. I, I felt as in the last few pages is that I just was going faster and faster yes. and yeah. sort of falling in this spiral as though I was going down in a whirlpool or falling into a bottomless pit or something. And then you come to that final sentence. And what you said really made me think about this, this sort of circle of history where, yeah. you know, he basically is sort of, uh, you know, almost quoting the, the thing about if you're ignorant of history, you're going to yes. be condemned to repeat it over and over and over again. Well, um, I feel like decay is a very kind of strong element throughout the whole book. And it's interesting. There are a couple of characters in this book who are writers. There's, uh, of course, Colonel Aureliano, who writes all this poetry, but which is then burned and nobody ever reads that. And there's another character late in the novel. I believe he's the Catalonian shopkeeper, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, who who writes all of this stuff and it kind of ends up lost and destroyed and he makes this remark, you know, well, that's the fate of all literature anyway. And and that really is the fate of all literature, except for books like this that somehow manage to still be read decades later. But but I kind of feel like, you know, that's, that's just kind of the forces of history and everything's going to be forgotten and everybody will kind of be forgotten at some point and it's just this kind of poetic resolution again uh, you have all you I go back to to the cruelty aspect you have all these people trying to build something and in the end uh, Garcia Marquez is like oh, I'm just gonna sweep it all away with this hurricane force wind and I think you know that's that's one of the lessons this book teaches us And yet I feel like the ending is just another opening, to tell you the truth. I don't I feel like, you know, after everybody's forgotten and all of the decay, uh, that it just creates an opportunity for all of this to be rediscovered again. I mean the truth of the matter is that Macondo is built and, you know, taken apart a bunch of times in the book. That, you know, things are constantly being sort of remade, you know, the house is remade how many times in this book, you know, and, you know, very important things within the house are made and remade. The laboratory is, you know, destroyed a bunch of times and then brought back. And the, the fishes and the burial shroud. Right. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that in, you know, it's about, I, I, I do, I find the ending to not be a closed ending at all. I, for, I read it as an open, as just, you know, we begin again. You know, somebody will come. It won't be a buen dia, obviously, because the line has, has, you know, died out. But somebody will come and will rediscover this and will tell this story again, or some version of it again. Um, you know, bits and pieces of this will continue. And... You know, in real life, that has happened. I mean, a lot of these characters in Cien Años de Soledad have come back in many uh, different novels, both named and not so named. Um, and so it just keeps kind of growing and growing. It, it ended, but not really. You know, I, I, I feel it very, very much the way Achi does that. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, the, the ending of that novel is very different from other things that we're, we can read today, for instance, where apocalyptic literature and, you know, the end of the world is so prevalent in movies and on television and literature. And there, and there are many good reasons why people are feeling that way. Um, so one, one, th one thing that we, would, we, we might be tempted to believe that that's what this book is doing, but it's not because it's not a universal apocalypse that we're seeing. It's one specific, specific. particular population. You know, uh, you know uh, those who are condemned, or, or you know, I forget the exact translation in English, um, but, um, but more, than, more than the ending is an opening, I believe, that is signaled. And this is where, you know, when I, when in, in my comments, I was um, 
um, asking us to think about the way in which writers also speak with other writers and read other writers. And uh, for me, that's a, a, a moment of Borges, you know, where you know, we ha we're in the garden of working paths. And the ending that feels so, so much like a climactic and full ending, in fact, really just opens up other possibilities. And, you know, um, that it's, it has to do with writing and deciphering of writing and understanding what writing contains is also part of that same openness. So I think Garcia Marquez wants to have it both ways. You know, the, the, the doom of ending, but the possibility of something else. Yeah. Also, I think, you know, one of the things about this book is to, uh, the, the story is to remember that they, they found this town with, you know, with a terrible mistaken conception. They think they're surrounded by water and they're not. You know, when they actually try to go find water, they can't find it. It goes on forever, you know. Um, I, of course, assume that he is playing off of uh, Virgilio Piñera with the La maldita circunstancia de aguas por todas partes, you know, the, the cursed circumstance of water everywhere. Um, because he was very influenced by the vanguardista movement in Cuba um, and how that sort of played out. Um, so the mistake still has to be contended with you know that the the error the 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 original sin if you want to call it you know still has to be contended with you know the united states has its original sin and latin america has very different original sin um and so and we we still have to contend with that 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 open wound is still open it's still we're still bleeding from that just one i'm <clears throat> Given that any first reading will then mm -hmm. affect and impact any further readings, yes. would you recommend the first reading to be in Spanish or in English if you oh, had the question. ability to read You've either read or? Read both, right? I've read it in both, and you know I've loved it in both. And for but you're right, you know, because you know my memories of each one are therefore slightly different. I think that you should read it first. To, wherever you're going to feel it most powerfully. Nah, that's a cheat answer. <laughs> actually, I think it's a good answer. It's a good, I, I think, I actually think it's a good answer because if you're going to be struggling, right, if you then you shouldn't because this is a book you want to surrender to. And if you're going to be going, if you have to read it with a dictionary next to you, then don't, 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 don't do that. So, yeah. uh, so that would be my question. Which one should I read it in first? I've read books in Spanish first and books in English first and I find I don't often go back and read it in the other language. Uh -huh. It sort of imprints itself yeah. in that language. So if you only have one reading, which would yeah, you do? Like, so where, <laughs> well, read the read God the original. Read it in I mean, Spanish. by all means, you read know, it in Spanish. if your Spanish is good enough, yeah. read yeah, the original. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah. Interesting. Thank yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one more question. It's not a question; it's a comment okay. because you brought something about Puerto Rico. I'm from Puerto Rico. And this book, I, I'm one of the ones that read it when I was very young, and I decided that I didn't want to read it again <clears throat> because I know that I have changed, and that book was so important in my life. As the point that <clears throat> I'm from a very small town that is, I'm from two small towns that are Macondos, and when I move here and people ask me, where are you from? I say, I'm from Puerto Rico, but we're in Puerto Rico. When I'm from a town like Macondo, when I had the first Coca-Cola when I was in the 80s, when we got the first Coca-Cola and the first Burger King, I don't remember when. But some, I just want to bring something that Archie brought is about the, it's a way to talk about Latin America history, history is what happened to us. I think it was you, Archie. Yes. No? And that's, you know, Every day that I have been reading what is going on to Puerto Rico, that's been very painful for us that we are here. This book comes to me every, every day because it looks like it's magic. Some things I cannot believe what's happening there, but it's, it's real. And the last point that I want to bring is I always have been, first I hear once that Gabriel Garcia Marquez say that if I, he knew about Puerto Rico before he wrote the book, he was, he would have been thinking about Puerto Rico when he was 
writing the book. But sometimes I live with this contradiction of coming from a Macondo town <laughs> and liking so many things that I bring, that I have, because I come from a town like Macondo, but also hating some other parts of me or not wanting to change or trying to open to other things that come because, that are me because I come from a town like Macondo. And it's a kind of contradiction. Just a comment. There's one more. There's, we got, there's one more question over we, here. Uh, we, we we have another couple of minutes. Uh, is there somebody? Uh, yeah, this guy right here in the oh, second well, row. I just uh, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, you, you mentioned like uh, Garcia Marquez as being you know, kind of the this this grandfather uh, uh, figure now in Latin American literature, and and I, I'm I'm wondering if if you could say some of the some of your favorite literature that has been spawned from this book. Oh. Wow. Or, or favorite authors, you know. Well, uh, I, I, I mentioned one, and you know, um, and this, you know, remember that that influences of this sort are always complicated because they don't always take what you would take. And, and, and sometimes they take things that they don't want to do. But I think, for me, it has to be Juno Diaz, mm -hmm. yeah, of the contemporary writers. Uh, and, and as Achi said, of course, if you ask Juno, you know, how much have you been influenced by uh, Garcia Marquez, he probably would say, none at all. But the reality <laughs> is that, of course, he has. <laughs> you know, he, he would be joking when he said that. But, you know, um, so I would say that um, what's interesting about that is that there have been generations now of writers that have been profoundly influenced by Garcia Marquez. Writers from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s and now into contemporary time. It continues to happen. Yeah, but I, I do think you mean um, the Brief and Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde, yes, right? Of course, of course. Right. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Because, yeah. I, mean, I mean, other stuff by Juno doesn't fall under that. No, 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 that. I agree, right. I agree. Certainly, uh, I, I mean Oscar Wilde. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if I was going to name somebody, I would name Wendy Guerra. Um, she's a Cuban writer. Um, she, Wendy Guerra, G-U-E-R-R-A. Um, so far, she's only got um, two books in English, um, Everyone Leaves, which was published by um, Amazon, and which I translated into English, and um, a book uh, of poetry called A Cage Within. I don't remember the translator. Um, and uh, her new one is coming out in, the, I believe, in in March or April. Um, it's called Revolution Sunday. I tra I just translated it for um, Melville House. And uh, Wendy was actually a student of Garcia Marquez. She was in a workshop with him at San Antonio de los Baños in Cuba, where Garcia Marquez set up an art school and a film school. Um, and um, she became very, very close to him um, afterwards and traveled with him and um, actually, you know, did transcri transcription for him and uh, stuff like that. And uh, she, um, and she has been resisting his influence in a lot of her novels. Um, there have been many novels in between Everyone Leaves, which was the first one, and Revolution Sunday, which is the newest one, but these are the ones that are coming out in English. But in Revolution Sunday, I think it finally, uh, she really embraces it in some very important uh, ways. I mean, it's not a saga in the same way as this in any way, but it's you can really feel it. And in fact, Garcia Marquez makes a very bizarre and sort of... Um, really sad cameo uh, in the book. But anyway, I don't know if Melville House has it up on their website yet, but um, Revolution Sunday and Wendy Guerra. I'll go a slightly different direction with this. We, we have someone who uh, was influenced by Garcia Marquez and didn't even know it. We had a student of Garcia Marquez. Uh, I'm gonna say somebody who really tried to define himself in opposition to Garcia Marquez and the Just boom an and, and, and all that it stood for. Um, because, you know, um, th this was a movement. This was the biggest thing in Latin American literature. This was uh, sold to American readers as this whole kind of enormous summation of Latin American books as we understood it. And as the generations came after that, people decided, well, 
that's not Latin American literature. I'm going to write Latin American literature. And one of those people who really did that was uh, Roberto Bolaño, oh, yeah. who, who's, whose prose is really very the opposite of Garcia Marquez. It's almost, it, well, it's not pedestrian because it's, uh, it's so kind of rich and textured, but it, it looks pedestrian kind of on the surface of it. And it's, it's just not kind of the lush feeling that you get from Garcia Marquez. And, and he also talks quite a bit about politics, but he really found his own way to discuss Latin American politics in his novels. And is every bit as profound and prophetic as Garcia Marquez, but it really is a very different way of bringing the political into the literary. So I would encourage him. Uh, you can read The Savage Detectives. You can read By Night in Chile, Distant Star. Those, those are all wonderful books. He also benefits from an extraordinary... Uh, translator and Natasha yeah. Wimmer, just and, and, magnificent. and Chris Andrews, and Chris Andrews. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Sorry. Well, thank you very much uh, for your attention, your contributions, and thank you to all the panelists and big hand, uh, big Ricardo. hand for our panelists. Thank you so much.